Well, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The time right now is seven o'clock in the Eastern time zone where I am right now. And that means it is time for us to start. Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have people from all over the world. If you are in the United States, then happy Thanksgiving to you, upcoming Thanksgiving. And for everybody else, we're almost in the holiday season, which means that it's perhaps time for us to think about the next year. And I really just wanna congratulate you and honor you for being here because that tells me that you're very serious about perhaps taking your career to the next level and really thinking about what the 2022 is going to bring. And if of course the MBA is one of your goals, then tonight my goal is going to be to give you some tips and strategies to help you achieve your goals. We're gonna do two things tonight, and this is going to be a fairly fast-paced class. The first thing is we'll talk about the GMAT. We'll talk about some specifically quantitative strategies. Uh, we'll also talk about how do I actually structure my studies so that I could get to a score of 700 or 750 or, or 650 or whatever your goal is on time so that I can meet my deadlines and start my MBA when I actually would like to start it. That's the first part of our seminar tonight. And the second part is we are going to have a special guest, an executive director from the Ivy Business School, one of the most competitive schools. It's the school that uses case, a case-based method that's often called the Harvard of Canada. And this person, the JD Clark from the Ivy Business School is going to share some of the really valuable strategies that will help you understand in a little more detail what the business schools are really looking for when they're assessing candidates. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Now, I've noticed that many of you, when you are answering the questions in the poll, said that this is the first time that you're attending our seminar. So let me actually end the poll and get it out of our way so that it's, uh, it's not uh, interrupting our discussion anymore. So if you are here for the first time, let me tell you a little bit what is it that you're getting yourself into. We're gonna do a few things today. I'm going to show things. Oh, we have some people from Africa, from Rwanda. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I know it's uh, probably very late at night for you. So I really appreciate that you came here at this uh, late hour or maybe even early hour for you. I know we have some people from Asia as well, from India and other countries in Asia. So again, good morning to you. So some of the things I'm going to show you, if you have not been studying for the GMAT, they might take you a little outside of your comfort zone, both in terms of the mass that we're going to cover and in terms of some of the strategies of how to approach this mass that perhaps are some of the strategies that you haven't really used before. Maybe you haven't even ever learned them before. And that is why I just want to encourage you to do get outside of your comfort zone. When I show you a question, just try it out. I know it might be a really long time since you've seen these sorts of questions, or maybe it was just today if you were studying for the GMA. It doesn't really matter. Just please do know that outside of your comfort zone, there is what's called the learning zone. So if you're getting slightly uncomfortable, that means you're learning. And of course, if you're getting very uncomfortable and you really don't know where to start, then don't worry, we are going to break things down. Just stay with us and uh, take lots of notes because we're gonna be talking a lot about strategies that can really help you on the real test. So let's start a little bit with a warm up question. I don't think that it's going to be very challenging for most of you. Maybe it would be, but I will give you about 45 seconds to deal with this question. The one thing I'm going to ask you to do or not to do rather is to use a calculator. Don't try to use Google either. Don't try to Google the answers to this question. We actually wrote this question, so you won't find the answer, but uh, try not to use a calculator either. I'm going to give you 45 seconds. And when you think you know what the answer is, just please put it in a poll and we'll talk about this question.
All right, so that's been 45 seconds. And as I could see, about two thirds of the people here in on this webinar actually answered. So why don't I share the results with you? So let me end the poll right now and let me share what we've got. So here, as you could see, the majority of the people who did vote, and again, it's about two thirds of the people, uh, voted for C, a smaller number for D, and a few people for A, B, and E. Well, let's find out what the answer is. Uh, here it is. Really? The answer is, drum roll, please. It is C. So if you got C, congratulations, first of all. But if you didn't get C, please don't worry. It does not really learn. And making mistakes while you're learning is actually the best way. If you come to our program, if you actually take our six-week GMAT Mastery course, we're going to get you to do so many mistakes in a class because we really want to show you what works and what doesn't work. And we want to show you the different traps that the GMAT is trying to trick you into. So once you get tricked into these traps, you're going to be so much better at avoiding them. That's why a lot in the class, what we're going to do is a, a very experiential learning. That's what we are hoping to simulate today in this short class as well, just to give you an idea of how you can study most efficiently for the GMAT. So let me ask you a question. For this question to do, so for us to do this question, what was it that we needed to know? Well, there were a few things. First of all, we needed to know what is an exponent. And that little thing, that little number above the other number, that actually just means how many times do we multiply that number onto itself. So three to the power of three is actually three times three times three. And no, it is not nine, it is actually 27. And if you remember the question, it was one to the power of one, which is one, two to the power of two, which was four, three to the power of three, which was 27. And if we add up these numbers, one plus four plus 27, we are going to get 32. Now, if you remember the previous slide, 32 was not among the answer choices, but two to the power of different numbers were the answer choices. So all we needed to do is now figure out what power of two is 32. Now, it's helpful to know that. It's something that you should definitely memorize for the test. Just save yourself time on the real test. But if you didn't remember that, don't worry. All you need to do is just keep multiplying 2 onto itself until you get 32 and count how many times did you do that. So if you multiply 2 onto itself five times, you're going to get to 32. And that's exactly what the answer is. The answer was 2 to the power of 5. So this is how we arrived at the answer. And really, all we needed to know is what's an exponent and how to add and multiply. That's it. Not very tricky. We just have to be careful. So you might wonder, OK, so is this really what the GMAT is going to be about? And is that what I'm going to need to do on a test? Well, the answer is kind of. Not exactly. We'll get to the more advanced strategies in a moment. But I just wanted to show you and perhaps maybe put your mind at ease a little bit. Is that the math on the GMAT rarely gets a lot harder. And in fact, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's take the GMAT's word for it. And the GMAT are, is the organization that actually makes the test. So here's what people who work for the GMAT, here's what they say. You need to know generally not more than what's taught in secondary school classes. And that means arithmetic, some elementary algebra, and some commonly known geometry concepts. Mostly fairly basic. So there is no trigonometry. There are no integrals, for example. And even the arithmetic is fairly basic. Usually has to do with the number properties, with the integers, fractions, and ratios, and so on and so forth. So if uh, you ever look at any, for example, GMAT forums, uh, you know, I belong to all of the GMAT forums. And just today, I was actually looking through one. And I saw a question that there was very clearly way more difficult than what will ever happen on the GMAT in terms of math. The question, however, was straightforward. If you knew what you were doing, then all you had to do is just go through the math. And after about three or four minutes, you're going to get the answer. There was no trick, just the math was hard. And every time I see this question, I really try to kind of almost feel some 
sympathy to people who see this question because they're wasting their time. Something like that will never show up on a test. What will show up on a test is something like what we've done right now and perhaps something that what you will see in a moment. So here's another question. By the way, you would notice that the question looks very similarly to the question that we've just done. There's three numbers, there are certain powers and there are five answer choices. So why don't I give you about a minute to try to figure out what is the answer to this question? And again, please do not use a calculator because that's not what you're gonna get access to on the test. So here you go. I'm gonna give you about a minute. Well, what just happened? It's been almost a minute and a half, and I still see that only about half of the people here on this webinar answered this question. So if anybody wants to share maybe in the chat box, what was more challenging about this question? Why wasn't it as easy as the previous question? And while we're doing this, I actually wanted to share the results with you. So as you could see, a lot more disagreement about what the answers are. A lot of people for D, a lot of people for C as well, and quite a few number, quite a few people for B and E as well. Nobody for A, surprisingly. So what was more challenging? Let me know. Just throw it in the chat box. What was harder about this question than the previous question? I've given you more time. Yeah, Jennifer is saying bigger numbers. Absolutely. So. The GMAT gave us bigger numbers, supposedly, that it would require a lot more time to solve it in your head. It's like exactly when you're saying, well, I mean, even if I use pen and paper, it's going to take me a while. And technically, I could do this, right? Because I know what's an exponent. And the GMAT told me very clearly that I just need to know you know, what's an exponent, how to add and multiply. So I can do that. Let's call it the, the theory way of doing the question or the way that we've done things in high school. So I could actually calculate 14 to the power of four, and that's the number. So all I have to do is just multiply it onto itself four times, 15 to the power of five and 16 to the power of six. And then of course I can add these numbers up. Notice how these numbers increase in size so dramatically. Initially, when you look at this, you're thinking, oh, 14, 15, and 16, you know, they gotta be pretty close to each other. But when you look at this, 14 to the four is 38,000. 16 to the six is 16 million, almost 17 million, oh my gosh. So when I add these numbers up, I'm actually going to get answer choice D. So if you got it, if you got a D and you didn't use a calculator, congratulations. Uh, but you probably didn't do what we've just done because very obviously this will take a long time without the calculator. So we need to do something else. And this is really where both the challenge and the opportunity on the GMAT lies. The challenge is, is that we have to learn something that we haven't learned before for most of us. The opportunity is we can learn something that can dramatically cut down on our work. So instead of spending eight minutes, what I'm going to show you in the moment is something that's going to take you maybe a minute or maybe a minute and a half. So here's what we can do. Now there's a strategy that we could use here that's called the units 
digit strategy. Now, of course, you don't have to actually know the name of the strategy, but here's how it works. If you were to multiply two numbers, any two numbers, doesn't really matter, but if you were to multiply these two numbers, and let's say you were to do a long multiplication, here's what you're going to do. You will start by multiplying the, the last digits. These last digits are called units digits because they represent how many units there are in each number. So what we do is we multiply six by seven. And of course, six by seven is 42. I hope that you're all comfortable with your tens multiplication table. And that is why without doing anything else, I know that that number, the product of these two numbers is going to end in a two because the four will get carried over, but the two will stay where it is. Now, remember, this is a multiple choice exam. My objective is not to show my workings. My objective is to find the right answer. And I want to stress that, ladies and gentlemen, this is very, very important. Your job is not to solve a problem, even though this is called a problem solving question. Your job is to find the right answer. And finding the right answer very often is a lot easier than you think with the right strategies, because the right answer is in front of you. There are five answers. One of them is correct. We just have to find it. And I'll show you how we can find it. So here's what we can now do now that we know this strategy. Well, 14 to the 4 is simply 14 times 14 times 14 times 14. So we're dealing with multiplication. That means we could use the units digit strategy. In fact, if I were to just go through the multiplication here, just paying attention to the last digit only, of course, 14 to the 4 is 14. We all know that. But 14 squared, if you know that it's 196, that's great. But if you didn't, again, remember the units digit strategy. We just take the final digits, 4 times 4. That's 16. And we only take a six because that's the final digits, right? So that's a really beautiful strategy because you always are concerned with just the final digit with nothing else. So four times four is 16, six stays, one is gone. So now we keep going because it's 14 to the four and we only got to 14 squared. 14 to the power of three is going to be now that number that was 14 squared multiplied by one more 14. So that number 14 squared was ending in a six. So if we multiply it by one more number that ends in a four, six times four is 24. So now we know that 14 cubed ends in a four. So let's take it one more step. 14 to the power of four is now gonna be 14 cubed times 14. So again, it's a number that ends in a four times another number that ends in a four, we get a six. So 14 to the power of four, I know without any doubt that that number ends in a six, guaranteed. Well, let me ask you a question. How about 15 to the power of five? What would be the number that 15 to the five ends in? Can you please chat, type this in the chat box? 15 to the five, what would that be? What's the final digit? Yeah, Andre is saying five. Uh, Alina, Mega, a few other people are saying five, awesome. Of course, because five times five is 25, times five is 25, and it's always going to be a five. Well, how about six? 16 to the power of six. Six, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, everybody's saying six, amazing. Six times six is 36, times six is 36. So here's what we found. We found that the first number was ending in a six, the second in a five, the third one in a six. And the strategy, the units digit strategy works for multiplication, but it also works for addition. If you were to do that addition, kind of the long addition, it would work exactly the same way. So six plus five plus six, that's a number that actually has to end in a seven. How many answer choices end in a seven? Only one. Remember we said we just have to find the right answer. So we found something about that answer. And then we know one of these have to work. So D must work. Therefore, after about two minutes, even if we have to actually calculate all of that, after two minutes, we're going to know our answer. Now, if we know our patterns, and if we know the patterns of four and the patterns of five and the pattern of six, then it will take us even less time. And knowing these patterns, by the way, we do teach these patterns in our class, in our GMAT Mastery program. We teach you the patterns for all the numbers and 
how you can actually deal with them and how you can actually spot these patterns. So we do a few training exercises so that you could see these things for yourself very easily. But one of the patterns you would have probably noticed if uh, you look through these numbers is that when we take a number that ends in a four, like 14 in this example, if the power was even, then the last digit will be six. And if the power was odd, the last digit will be four. Exactly, Mehak is saying the same thing in the chat. So that's great. Then you're seeing this pattern. So that means if the GMAT asked us to calculate 14 to the power of 328, well, I don't really care what, what power was that, that 328 is the even number. Therefore, I know 14 to the power of that number has to end in a six. Exactly. Yes, so any even power of any number that ends in a four will end in a six. Any odd power will end in a four. So that's a strategy that we can use to do this question. And we can do this comfortably and confidently because first of all, this is a strategy that works 100% of the time. So we're not taking any guesses or so. And um, this is also the strategy that's gonna take us a lot less time. Now, Pariha is asking a very valid question. What if there are two answer choices that end in a seven? That's a very good question. And the answer is the GMAT isn't out there to see how well you can do on multiplication. It's really out there to see how you can think. So if there are two answer choices that ends in a seven, then there will be some way, maybe some other way for you to break the tie. And usually the way would be that these numbers will be vastly different. Like there could be a number that ends in a seven that's let's say 17 million. And there could be another number that ends in a seven that's let's say 17 billion, right? So you can actually use another strategy to break the tie. In fact, let me show you another way of looking at this question and you could see where I'm going with this because this is an awesome way of approaching the question. But what if you don't have these two minutes? What if you don't even have a minute? What if you just have 30 seconds to do this question? Let me show you a way that, again, for some of you might be a little outside of your comfort zone, but if you want to get a very high score, you have to be comfortable doing these things because there will be questions that are going to be a lot trickier than what I've just shown you. And you have to really know how to work with the test and how sometimes to play a little game uh, and maybe even a little bit of a guessing game because you can't possibly do all of the questions from start to finish. You just don't have enough time. So you gotta really teach yourself and or come and we'll teach you how to use more of these strategic guessing strategies. So let me show you a strategic guessing strategy that you could have used on this question if you only had 30 seconds. So here's what you could have done. You look at the question and you could have said, well, there's something I notice here. And that's actually something really important. I don't know if you noticed that, but the answer choices were very far apart. It wasn't random. There was a purpose for that. There was a reason for that. Nothing on the GMAT is random, right? There's, there's a specific purpose for things. So here's what I can do. If the answer choices are far apart, one of the strategies that I could use is I could just roughly estimate the answer. Because if, if I'm a little bit off, like maybe I'm off by you know, 20% or even by 50%, doesn't really matter. The answer choices are so far apart that if I know my answer is about 6 million, I know for sure it's B, right? Even though I'm off by 50%. So I could actually do this. And in fact, if I were to estimate this number, which was what some people might choose to do, I would probably estimate 16 to the power of six, because if you've paid attention to what we talked about two slides ago, you probably remember that 14 to the power of four was 38,000 38, and 16 to the power of six was actually almost 17 million. So I know these numbers are just so dramatically different because I'm dealing with exponential growth that if I were to estimate this, I'll just take 16 to the six. So this is if I were to estimate, but I won't do this because 
I'm just going to continue working with the question. So I look through the answer choices and I realize that if I were to estimate, I'm going to arrive at the right answer because the answer choices are so, so different. But the GMAT, of course, knows that. They know exactly what people do. They test these questions multiple times. They do lots of experiments on this question. They know exactly how people think. These are very smart people. They spend millions of dollars each year studying how people think so that they can find better ways to trick us. So that's why we need to really know how to use their weapons against us. So one of the things they're gonna do is they're gonna say, well, you know, if somebody estimates, they'll probably arrive somewhere between C and D and then they'll be stuck. And then they're gonna go back and say, okay, the estimation strategy didn't work. I got to go back and do all the workings, right? That's what they're hoping most people are going to do. And they obviously did some studies. And that's probably exactly what's happening. So what we can do is we can say, OK, I understand this. So I know, based on what I just learned about the GMAT and about this question, is that the answer choices that are going to be correct are probably going to be C or D. I'm kind of pretty sure that because of how the question is set up, C or D will be my correct answer. I'm not 100% sure, and yes, there are exceptions, but most of the time, that's how things are going to work. And again, remember, you got to learn how to do this if you want to get a very high score. We get, by the way, just a little bit of a digression. We get a lot of our clients who get above 700. I'll show you some statistics. And almost all of them say that at some point, they had to use strategic guessing a lot because there are questions where you just really can't do all the workings or can't really use some of these kind of more strategies where you have to work things out. So we know that the answer is probably C or D. So the question then is, if you were to know this, let's imagine we eliminated A, B, and E. So now we're down to C and D because we know that that's the game that GMAT is trying to play with us. So let me ask you a question. How would you break the tie? Now, knowing it's C or D is already hopeful. I'm at 50-50 chance. So now I can just simply choose C or choose D and I got a 50-50 chance. That's much better than where I started. But if I want to actually get this question right, what would be the strategy I could use? Yeah, somebody's saying if I can actually calculate 16 to the power of six, yeah, maybe, but I don't have time for that. Yeah, exactly. I could estimate this. But that just lands me into COD. I don't really have time to do all the calculations. Yeah, Alina is saying, well, wait a second. What if? And then, yeah, I mean, we can, let's not digress from this strategy. So what we can do is, yeah, we could estimate, but again, we're going to just simply between, be between C and D. So what we can do is if I know it's C or D, and now all I have to do is break the tie all I need to do is look at whether the answer has to be odd or even. I got to pay attention, right? The GMAT, one of the most important skills for your success on the GMAT is attention to detail. So Alina was just mentioning that one of these is even and another one is odd. Noticing that is a skill. Again, that's a skill you can develop. And that's what it's going to take to get a very high score. So knowing that one of them is even, one of them is odd, looking at this original question and knowing that the original answer has to be odd because we have two even numbers and one odd, now I know it has to be D. And I can literally do this in 30 seconds. So that's an example of using strategic guessing to your advantage in a very, very kind of work smart way. So that brings us to an important question. I hope you enjoyed this question. And it demonstrates something really important. And that is, what would it really take for us to get a score of 700? Because you may have heard that people, let's say who have a math background or engineering background, will have a lot of advantage on the GMAT. And people who don't will really struggle. And that's absolutely not the case. Because, uh, okay, sorry, Fariha is asking, how did we get, uh, well, we have two even numbers and one odd. So two even numbers and one odd will get us to an odd number. So that's how we got to an odd, right? 14 and 16 are even, and 15 is an odd number. So according to the GMAT, 
this is the test that is not going to really require your knowledge of, let's say, you know, business. We're trying to get into a business school. So some people might expect that maybe we need to know something about business. And the answer is, of course, no, we don't. That's why we're getting into a business school. But many people think that we really need to know math on a very, very deep level, especially if you come from a country where there's a lot of attention being placed into the STEM education, into the math. You might think that you are at a huge advantage, or you might think people from these countries are at a huge advantage. But the GMAT can't really work that way, because that might mean that these are going to be the people who are going to get into the business schools and they're going to do really well in the school. So anybody with a math background will essentially be a very successful businessman, a business person. And that's not the case. What the GMAT really tests is your ability to think on a higher order level. That's what they call it. So essentially they're saying, well, look, you need to have these higher order reasoning skills because the skills are what matters. The other things you can learn. In fact, math, you can Google it. You can use a calculator or Excel spreadsheet in your work, not on the GMAT. But your ability to think a little bit outside the box, pay attention to detail, look at the big picture, manage your time well, make proper decisions, that's what the GMAT really, really tests. And that's why it is going to be a different test compared to some of the tests we've done before. Because most of the tests we've done before were knowledge-based tests. This is a skills-based test. So here is the difference between the knowledge and the skill. Now, the knowledge is, for example, knowing how to swim. The skill is actually being able to swim. That's a huge difference. Because if I were to learn a new sport, and you can think of the GMAT as really a sport. It is, by the way. It is a sport for your brain. You are complete, completing challenges that are fairly tricky. They increase in difficulty. And you only have two minutes per question. And you just got to keep going and you got to get a good score so you can beat other people because this is the bulk of the exam. And it only matters how well you do compared to other people. And that's what's called the percentile score. So simply reading a book is not going to be enough. And memorizing a lot of the things. I speak with a lot of people. I do a lot of these seminars. I teach classes and I also do lots and lots of consultations. I usually do about four or five one-on-one -on -one consultations a day, 300 days a week. Oh, sorry, 300 days a year. And the, 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 the comment that I hear most often from people I speak with is they're saying, I've read this book cover to cover, or I got this you know, self-prep program. And you know some of these programs that are advertised very heavily on the, uh, on the different GMAT forums. So I went through all of this program. I spent like three months or six months, and I got like five notebooks of, of my notes. I got like a thousand pages of notes that I took in these six months. And now I look at these notes and say, what do I do next? So we do this because we've been trained that knowledge is power. We've been trained that all we have to do is just cram a lot of knowledge into our brain. I know I've done this. I know you probably have as well. And then hopefully on the day of the exam, we still remember that, right? That's why a lot of people are saying, well, I got to study for the GMI just before my exam because I hope that I can still remember all of that stuff. But that's not how the exam works. And that's why for most people, it takes somewhere between three to six months to prepare for the GMAT. Now, I know some people take a lot longer. I really feel a lot of sorry for these people because they're putting their life on hold. Anybody can prepare for the GMAT in six months. Let me put it this way. While working full time. I can tell you this confident they've been teaching the GMAT for 12 years. And I've seen people who are, let's just say, don't come across really smart, and they were able to get a score of 700 or more in six months or less. So this requires, again, approaching the test the way you would approach training for a sport. So we would, that usually means that you got to know the rules, but you also got to practice a lot. You got to get the right coaching, and you got to learn the right strategies. And that's how you're going to be successful. So that's how all sports uh, people do that. So I'm really, I'm really grateful to you that for this kind of hour and a half, I'm going to be your coach. Uh, this is my official score report, just to show you that everything is legit. I'm showing this to you not to impress you. It uh, honestly impresses me. 
that uh, I got a score of 750. By the way, it took me about two weeks to get that score. And in case you're wondering how Sergey was able to do this, many people are saying, Sergey, you're a genius. And my answer is absolutely not. Um, because really, honestly, if I were to tell you the whole truth, it took me years to learn these strategies. The reason why it took me just two weeks to prepare for the GMAT is because all I had to do is use the strategies I've learned in school and learned how to apply them for the GMAT. And if you come to a verbal refresher class three weeks from now, I'm actually going to tell you exactly the resources I've used in two weeks to prepare for the test. That's it. And I just took two practice tests. But see, it, it did take, it really take me years to learn these strategies. And I've been teaching the GMAT now for 12 years. So it's a long time to learn how to teach others. And the reason why I'm actually so grateful for this experience that I've had and for my ability to to really share this with other people is that I had amazing teachers when I was a child. I, I, I really, I'm, I'm grateful to them because whatever they taught me is what helped me actually do so well on the GMAT, to be honest. And I also, just for full disclosure, I have a Master of Mathematics and a Bachelor of Physics. And the only reason why I was able to get those degrees is that I've learned in school how to think on a different level. This was my math teacher. It was just, he was so gifted. He taught us, he had, you know, all of the kind of children, children in the class, he taught us and he really worked with us and he taught us things that are beyond the high school curriculum and the middle school curriculum. He was my teacher in the middle school and the high school for seven years. So he taught us really how to approach these questions. So all of these tricks, like the units digit strategy, some of the other tricks that I'm gonna show to you today, I knew these when I was like 12 years old, 13. And then I competed in different math Olympiads and uh, a lot of the people in our class did really well. So it's thanks to him and some of the other really amazing teachers that I've had, I was exposed to these strategies. And that's why the work that I'm doing right now is really more of a tribute to my teachers. And I still have teachers uh, and some of the instructors that work with, with us. One of our instructors has been teaching the GMAT since 1998. You can only imagine, well, that's what, 23 years teaching the GMAT. That's longer than some of you were, were alive, you know, before some of the people were born here in the, on this webinar, he has already started to teach in the GMAT. So that is why the most important takeaway from this is that it does take time, but of course it wouldn't take you seven years, so it took me, because if you stay focused and if you learn exactly what you need to learn for the GMAT, you can achieve some amazing results very quickly. Let me show you an example. And I, again, I'm showing this to you. There's, there's a reason for that. And the reason I just wanted to show you what would it actually take. So here's uh, Daria. She came to our class uh, in uh, early 2020. Just as soon as the pandemic hit, I think it was like April 2020, we started teaching our class in the virtual format. We used to teach classes strictly in person before that. And uh, Daria came to our virtual class and said, look, I scored 380 on a practice test. And this is of course, not a very high score. I don't know if you looked at the structure of the test and the scoring system, but this is something like the bottom 10%. And within three months, she took our six week course. She was studying full time. So Daria wasn't working. She needed a huge improvement. So she dedicated three months, but not three years, right? Three months. And within these three months, she was able to get a score of 700. Most importantly, she said what helped her is she learned how to think outside the box. She learned how to manage her time and stress. This was very important. Now, again, this is a comment she wrote for us on Google. If you haven't read our Google reviews, then I would encourage you to just go and read through them. Just see what people usually comment on, what was the most helpful to them. And she ultimately learned just how to think differently, how to think like a CEO. This is what the, the, the sort of a mantra that we use here at Admit Master, because if you want to become a future leader and a future maybe CEO of a company, got to learn how to think like one. CEOs do things differently from other people. That's why they make a lot of money. So you can believe it or not, you can learn these strategies, you can do really well. Uh, I got a comment actually from uh, one of our clients recently who just took our course. She hasn't done the GMAT, she just finished a few weeks ago. And she said, I just want to tell you of the impact that the Admit Master course 
made on me because I developed a lot of confidence. So I started applying to new jobs and I just got my dream job. I wanted this job for many years. Finally, I gained enough confidence and now I feel like I have the right skills. And she's actually starting this new job and she's still going to continue with the GMAT to do her MBA, but now not, not this year anymore, a couple of years down the road. So a lot of great things that you can learn by studying for the GMAT properly. And by the way, you can enjoy the process a lot, right? I hope you enjoy this class. Uh, our class, our real class, are going to be even more interactive because I'm going to be able to see you as well and hear you so we can interact more. Now, if you look at the structure of the test, and we're going to get back a little bit more into how to study and how to structure your studies. But speaking about the structure of the test, you would also notice that the test consists of four sections. And the most important words here in the names of the sections are the words analytical and the words reasoning. So again, it brings us back to the fact that this is all about learning how to reason, how to analyze. And if you, again, maybe even think about, forget being a CEO, think about the first dream job of many people who go to a business school, and that's working in a consulting firm. Maybe like McKinsey or BCG or Bain or Deloitte or some of these big consulting firms. A lot of MBA graduates would want to go there and work in these firms because they know that their career is set for pretty much for life if they have experience working for these firms. So these firms, by the way, will be looking at your GMAT score. So don't just think that you need to do the GMAT for your getting into a business school. You also would need to do the GMAT, first of all, to get scholarships into a business school and also potentially for your recruitment. That's why sometimes we get clients who come to us who already are doing the MBA. They would come and they would take a course because they would need to get a higher score. So if you think about what consultants really do is they do a lot of anal analysis and then they present recommendations and they go through different frameworks and they use different strategies to really reason and find the best solution. That's exactly what we're gonna do here as well. Now the quantitative reasoning and the verbal reasoning sections are the two sections that contribute the most to your total score 200 to 800. And if you look at the structure of these sections then you would notice that there are two types of questions in quantitative reasoning, they're called problem solving and data sufficiency. That's what we're talking about today. And then the verbal reasoning section actually has three types of questions, sentence correction, critical reasoning and reading comprehension. And we are going to be talking about these three question types on December 14th. So if you haven't registered for our verbal refresher class, please do so. Now, another very important thing about the GMAT, and then we'll get into talking more about the strategies, is that this is a computer adaptive test. So what this means is that the test gets harder if you're doing well, and it gets easier if you're not doing well. So this has some very serious implications for us. And that is that if we want to get a high score, we're not gonna see a bunch of easy questions and some medium and maybe a couple hard. We are going to see a lot of hard questions. We don't get more time for these hard questions. And because we see a lot of hard questions, we really need to know how to deal with them in under two minutes. That's why we need to know these strategies. That's why just simply doing the workings or using the sort of algebra that we've done in high school is not gonna work. You really got to get a little outside of our comfort zone here and learn something new. So that brings us to an important question. And uh, I wanted to hear your opinion of what you think. And that's why, uh, as we're going to be doing some questions, I will be making sure that we address some of your concerns about the mass section. So please let me know, and you can choose more than one. What is most challenging to most people about the quant section of the GMAT? the quantitative reasoning section. What's most challenging? So far I'm seeing a few people are saying, I'm not a math person. You know, I haven't really liked math. I haven't really done math in a while. I remember we had a client a few years ago who came and just said, look, I'm not a math person. Said, well, a lot of people are not math people. He said, no, Sergey, you don't understand. He said, I don't really know how to add two fractions. He said, I haven't taken math since grade seven. I'm a musician. I'm playing 11 musical instruments. Our band is touring the country. I'm doing no math. Well, guess what? Because he couldn't do math the traditional way, he had to learn the strategies. And he ended up with a score of 760, got into a school with a full ride scholarship and then got a job in a consulting firm well, of all the firms, right? And it's all because he just said, this is a test of patterns. 
I got to look for patterns. I cannot do math, so I got to do something else. Uh, there, a lot of people are saying, it's been a while since I've done this sort of math. Yeah, exactly. This kind of math for most of us, we've done a really long time ago. I have a master of mathematics. When I was doing the GMAT, honestly, I had to remember what's a quadratic equation and exactly how I can approach it because I haven't done this sort of stuff for many, many years, right? I haven't done quadratic equations in the university. I've done a lot of harder things like multi-dimensional fractal geometry, but I haven't done quadratic equations. And of course, time pressure. I have so very little time per question that it kind of forces me to do something different. So let's do a question. Let me show you a question. This is going to be now what's called a word problem. So it's a problem that is essentially described in words. There's also an exhibit. So there's like a table that we're given. Here we have three bags. We have a number of marbles in each of these bags. And we have the percent of marbles in each of these bags that are blue. And the question is simply, if a third of the total number of the marbles in the three bags combined is blue, how many marbles are there in total in bag Q? There are five answer choices. I'll give you, well, how's that? I'll give you a minute and a half to work on this question. Do whatever you need to do, except please don't Google this question and please don't use a calculator. So there you go. Just do your best. And after a minute and a half, we are going to talk about this question. Wow, question looks really challenging. I see so far, it, and it's been two minutes, only a third of the people here answered this question. So why don't we do this? Why don't you just maybe pick an answer, whatever looks best to you, doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to give you five more seconds to make a choice. Uh, as you probably know, the exam is a forward moving exam. That means you're not going to see the next question until you ask, answer the previous question. Five more seconds, and then we'll talk about this question. All right, that's it. Let me share the results with you. So as you could see, um, most people are for D and E, a few people for C, um, very small number of people for B and nobody for A. So let's keep that in mind and let's go back to this question. Now, this is a question that at some point, if you were to do this question, you may have had this sort of a formula, right? Did, did anybody use this formula? or some sort of a variation of this formula? If yes, just give me a thumbs up in the chat box. Because we have uh, three bags, we have the percentage in each of these three bags and 
then that's going to give us the total number of blue bags or blue marbles. And that has to equal a third of the total. So that's the formula. That's the formula in the textbook at the back of the book. That's the formula you're going to see. Did anybody use this formula or any sort of a variation of this formula? If yes, just give me a thumbs up. Or oh, I, I see a few thumbs up in the chat box. All right. So this is the, the sort of a way that you know I like to call it the, the work hard way of doing this question. Right? Because by the way, how hard was this question? Well, I just wanted to get a little bit of an idea. So I went to the GMAT forums and I just looked through the list of questions. This is a question from the official GMAT guide. It is question number 161 uh, in the official guide 2021, 2022, just in case you're interested. And this question, according to this forum, was classified as very hard. Basically meaning, ladies and gentlemen, please do not attempt this at home. Experts only. And that's why when you look through the explanation, it is a hard question. It requires a lot of hard work to do this question. All right, well, I don't know about you, but I like to work smart. I'm a hard worker. I work seven days a week. I love my job. But I love to work smart. So why don't we look at a, maybe a different way of, of approaching this question? I just want to do a little bit of pre-work in this question. One of the easiest things that I can do here, if I look at the, at the chart, I could probably easily calculate the number of new blue marbles in each of the bags. See, if I have 37 marbles in total in back P, and I know about 11% of them are blue, and of course, the marble is a marble, I cannot have half a marble, then I know that, of course, that number has to be equal to four. Well, if I look at back Q, 66.7% to the nearest tenth, then, of course, there's two thirds, right? And we got to be comfortable with knowing what's 66.7%. And then back R, 50% is a half. So half of 32 is 16. So now this is what I call the work smart way. Because now we're going to start finding the right answer. I don't want to do all the calculations. I want to find the right answer. So let me ask you a question. Please respond in the chat box. Based on what we've done so far, I've done anything else yet, but based on what we've done so far, is there any sort of an insight that we know about the number of marbles in back Q? Alina is saying the number of marbles in back Q has to be a multiple of three. Alina, you're absolutely right because I need to be able to take two thirds and for that number to have to still be an integer. The only way that's gonna work is if the number is divisible by three. Now, what answer choices are not divisible by three? Well, how about five? Five is not divisible by three. How about 23? It's also not divisible by three. And how about 46? It's also not divisible by three. So I haven't done anything else yet. I haven't done no formulas. I haven't done any complicated math. I already know that my answers are nine or 12. So I got two answer choices left. So now, yeah, a few people are saying 12. Hold on that moment. Yeah, I know more people voted for 12, but also a few people voted for nine. So let's see, maybe the minority is right. So let me ask you a question. We have two answer choices. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to try them out. I'm going to try one of them and see if it works. So the question then is, how many of these do I have to try to find the right answer? Do I need to try both of them? Or would it be OK if I try just one of them? Yeah, a few people are saying one of them's enough. Because if I try one and if it doesn't work, then it has to be the other one. That kind of is the process of elimination, right? We already eliminated three answer choices. We're down to two. So if I can eliminate one more, then I know the one that's left is the right one. So a few people were actually saying that the, the answer is 12. Uh, let's see. Let's see if it's 12. All I'm going to do is just say X is 12. That's it. So I'm going to plug in 12 back into my chart. What's 2 thirds of 12? That's 8. So now I got the total number of marbles. I got the total number of blue marbles. And remember, a third of my marbles has to be blue. So if I were to just now add up the totals, 37 plus 12 plus 32, 
Anybody can do a quick math, that's 81. And four plus eight plus 16, if anybody can do a quick math, that's 28. So let me ask you a question. Is 28 a third of 81, yes or no? Don't use a calculator. Just give me an answer, please. Is 28 a third of 81, yes or no? This should not be a hard answer. Yes, Jennifer is saying no, Andrew is saying no. It's actually something that's very easy to see. And that is why 12 is not the right answer. It doesn't work. 28 is not a third of 81. And that is why the answer has to be B. It has to be nine. By the way, when I asked you whether 28 is a third of 81, we actually didn't even technically needed to calculate that because you might think, okay, Sergey, you, you're trying to teach us a way to do the questions where I'm doing very little mass, but how about trying to add 37, 12, and 32? Well, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, please. You don't have to do this because 37 plus 12 plus 32 is going to be an odd number, right? 12 plus 32 is even, 37 is odd. 4 plus 8 plus 16, on the other hand, is an even number because we have three even numbers we're trying to add. An even number, of course, cannot be a third of an odd number because any odd number divisible by three will always give us an odd number if it's even divisible by three. So let me ask you a question. How much algebra did we do here in this question? I mean, we've done very little arithmetic. We've done no algebra. So what is really the chance of us making a mathematical mistake? Well, if we've done very little math, the chance of us of making a math mistake is very small. So our objective, and this is how we get the questions right fast. And that's what we teach in our GMAT mastery program is not how you can do three pages of formulas in two minutes, that's impossible. But how you can do two lines or maybe three lines, how you can take some very strategic notes, but know exactly what we're doing. So that in two or three steps and not in 27 steps, you can get to the right answer. You can find the right answer. And this is how you save time. So you can't really save time by doing things faster. And you may wanna write this down and maybe write it in, in red ink and maybe just put it as a scotch tape uh, just in front of you, in front of your desk that the secret to doing things fast is not to doing things faster, but it's doing less. We're taking fewer steps, less calculations, and we find in the right answer instead of solving the problem. So let me ask you a question then. Which of these approaches would you enjoy more? The work hard or the work smart? And most importantly, which approach do you think a successful manager or a successful CEO would do? As a CEO, do you think the CEO will say, okay, let me write down the formula. And, and then, then you know, the, the board of directors is sitting there and CEO is just trying to sweat and do the formula. Would the CEO say, okay, so that's about two thirds of our, uh, of our divisions are profitable and you know, half of them are not. And that's what they do, right? That's how they think. And that's exactly how you can think on the GMAT as well. That's what we call thinking like a CEO, right? Very difficult question. Again, if you don't believe me, you can go on the GMAT forums and see what they say. And you will see that most of the strategies being discussed are really the strategies about how do I do that formula, but more efficiently. Speaking about thinking like a CEO, I wanted to show you one more question. We will do another question as well, but I wanted to show you and then we'll also talk about how to study for the test as well. But I wanted to show you a data sufficiency question that is going to be uh, quite good at demonstrating one of the approaches that we can take on the GMAT, specifically about thinking like a CEO. Now, if you have never seen a data sufficiency question, don't worry, you're gonna see one now. The way this question is gonna look like, is you are going to see, and please don't read it yet. I'll give you time to read it, don't worry. You're gonna see a question that might have some additional information in it. Uh, this is called formula stimulus of the question. Sometimes called the question stem. So the, in this, basically in this stimulus with the question stem, you see some information and a question. That's all we need to know. Now, 
This information in the question by itself is never enough to answer the question. We need some additional information. That additional information is going to come in one or the second statement, one or two statements, or maybe both. And if you look at the answer choices, you would notice that the answer choices actually don't contain any numbers, even though the question was, what was the price? But the answer choices don't have that price. Instead, your job is to identify which of the two statements will be necessary to answer this question. You could have uh, just maybe one of them, or maybe only the other, or maybe each one independently, or maybe you need both. But that's the objective. So don't necessarily try to solve the problem. You just have to figure out which of the statements is enough to answer the question. And once you figure that out, look through the answer choices and pick the answer choice that matches what you found. I am going to give you one and a half minutes and we'll talk about this question. We have 15 seconds left, so please choose your answer. All right, let me stop the poll right now and let me share the results with you and we'll see how you did. So as you could see, the most popular answer was C and then we have B and E, a few people for D and nobody for A. So this is a question from the official GMAT guide. And if you look through the official explanation, here's how it's going to sound. Let R be the regular price and D be the discounted price and P1 be the first profit and P2 be the second profit. And, oh my God, looks like we're getting into algebra, into some really complicated stuff. I don't know about you, but my stress level is going up even though I have a master of math. So what I wanna do instead here is I want to remember what's my objective. My objective is really to understand what is it that I need to know in order to answer this question. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to think like a CEO. And by the way, here in this question, it's actually very easy to do because I can just pretend I'm a CEO of this clothing store. So I sell shirts. And when somebody walks into my store, they can buy one shirt at the regular price, or they can buy two shirts and get the second price at the, or the second shirt at the discounted price. Now, the way I'm going to set up my pricing, and this is, I'm just paraphrasing what the question was saying, is that my profit from selling one shirt is going to be equal to my profit of selling two shirts. So what this means essentially is that I am giving away the second shirt at cost, right? I'm making no profit. My profit's the same from one shirt or from two shirts. I'm selling the first shirt at regular price. So I'm making all my profit on that shirt. 
And then my second chart, I'm making zero profit. That's it. So making a zero profit literally means that I'm selling that shirt at my cost, right? I'm making zero dollars. So if it costs me a certain number of dollars, that's gonna be the price I'm selling it for. But I want to make sure that my customers walk away with the purchase and they have a good experience and they're happy and I've made a sale. And otherwise they maybe would have just bought one shirt, but now they bought two, so they're happy. And I sold one shirt at the regular price, so I made my profit. That's how I think, right? Like a CEO of this store. So let's stay focused on this question. What I know is I'm making zero profit on the second shirt. That means that the discounted price of the second shirt is equal to the cost to me, the store. So now I'm going to look through the statements and I'm going to see which of these statements gives me enough information to answer that question. What was the discounted price? Statement number one tells me that the regular price was $16. While that's great, price doesn't help me find the discounted price because I don't know the amount of the discount. I don't know my cost. So it, maybe it's interesting to know, but it's not enough. Statement number two, surprisingly, gives us exactly what we need. Because see, if I know that we buy this shirt from a wholesaler at $12 and we sell it at the same $12 to the customer, that that discounted price is exactly $12. And because statement two gives us exactly what we need, we actually didn't need to know statement one. Statement two by itself gives us exactly what we need. Statement two is sufficient. Statement one was not. The answer is B, there's no mass, and we can do this in one minute. Now, this of course will require us to use a lot of confidence, knowing what we're doing, knowing what to look for and developing that confidence. So what would it take to develop that confidence? Well, one of the most important things it will help you develop that confidence. And let me show you just a quick example of one of our students. Her name is Darini, and she just started her MBA at her dream school in the UK. She was trying to study for about, before she came to us, she told me she was trying to study for about four years and she was ready to give up. She was just, she had no confidence anymore in doing the GMAT because all she did is she did a bunch of questions she would, every time she would try a few questions, she told me she had a lot of books on her shelf. So she would pull up the books, try a few questions, get many of them wrong. And she just didn't feel like she can actually do this. And at that level, or at that time, her anxiety about the test was so high that she couldn't even, at some point, she couldn't even touch the test because she's like, I know I'm just going to fail. So why even try? And then a friend recommended she come to our class. And one of the most important things we've done for her is that we gave her a structure of how she can follow the program and how she can build back that confidence. And uh, we had to be something, and because our class is fairly small, we, work, we, we really try to understand you a little bit more and uh, maybe a lot more. And we try to understand your personal situation, some of the challenges you're facing. So we do this coaching at the beginning of your course, just so that when we work together to develop your study plan, we give you some suggestions of how you can overcome things. And specifically for Darini, one of the suggestions, one of the strategies we've used is that initially as she was doing the exercises, the way that she was keeping track of her success was not by how many questions she got right. Because initially she wasn't getting too many questions right. But initially she was tracking her success by how many questions she actually got done that day. And her objective was to do a certain number of questions a day and that's how she defined her success. So she actually built her confidence by knowing that she follows through. And eventually in about three months, she got a score of 700 and she just couldn't believe it. She gave herself a minimum, a bare minimum of six months. She was gonna start her MBA in 2022 and she, she actually started this year because she was able to start her MBA sooner. So she didn't have to wait another year. And uh, that was really the game changer. She came to our class, she learned all the strategies, she was applying them, but she had a very important thing and that was the structure of exactly how she's gonna go through this experience. 
So how do we develop this structure? I wanna use another analogy and you'll see that I love analogies. This is just how we understand things because in our brain, there's certain things we're familiar with and certain things we are not. So for us to make something that we are unfamiliar with easier for us to understand and work with, we gotta make some neural connections. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you some analogies. I've used an analogy of a sport. So you're preparing for the GMAT as you're training for a sport. I'm gonna use another analogy of actually navigating your GMAT prep as an analogy of navigating a corn maze. Now you can think of this and maybe that's something that something happened to you or with you when you were a child, maybe with your parents or your siblings or your friends, you went to this, this amazing entertainment, it's called a corn maze and you walk in and you try to find your way out. That's basically how this works. So you try different things, right? You go left and you try this thing and you hit a dead end and then you go back and try something else. And you know, you're having a good time and hopefully before darkness, you're gonna get, a, get out on the other side. That's how this works. And the reason why I'm using this analogy is this is how most people approach their GMAT preparation. They essentially just say, let me try this. Let me go this direction. Let me try these books. Let me try these resources. Let me go to this seminar. Let me go to this YouTube video. If essentially all we're doing, we're trying to study for the GMAT. Right? But you know, if you've read a lot of help books, self-help books, trying doesn't necessarily mean we're accomplishing things. But we usually try and things at first by reading some books. And one of the books that most people are reading at first is the, the official GMAT guide. Unless you got some books from friends, in which case sometimes it's gonna be different. But if you didn't get any friend, books from friends, you usually go on like, let's say the GMAT or mba.com or Amazon or Chapters or Barnes & Nobles, and you see what's the best book on the GMAT and you see the official guy. I gotta get that book. It's official and it's a guide. It's gonna guide me exactly through what I need to do. And it's you know three books and not just one. I gotta make sure that I get all three. I gotta pack. And then as we are doing these questions, what we realize as we actually reading the introduction to this book, what's interesting to know is that this is a source of questions from past exams. That's actually on the cover of the book. That's a source of questions. So it's actually not a guide. It is a question bank and you can access it through a book or you can access it online. We use this question bank in our class because when you come to our class, we assign about 1500 questions for homework. And a thousand of them is from the official guide and 500 from our book. So by the time you're done with our course, you will have done one and a half thousand questions. And then we give you over 5,000 more and a bunch of practice tests because that's what, I, you're obviously not gonna use all of them, but you use many of them to actually get better at specifically the areas you need to practice. And we'll help you structure your homework so you don't have to do all 1,500, but you just do the ones where you're struggling with the most. So, this is how most people are approaching. And then they're looking at the book, they're trying the questions, then they look at the back of the book and they see the dollar P1 and the dollar P2 and they're saying, wow, it's gotta be a better way. And then they're trying something else. Many people are going to try different strategy GMAT books. So maybe you looked at these books or maybe the Bible or the premium or the ultimate or the cracking. And see the interesting thing about all of these strategy books is they all contain lots and lots of valuable information. Lots of lots of things in the GMAT are really valuable. Sometimes they're not the most efficient. Sometimes they don't really tell us what we need to pay attention to. And there's so much information. And literally by the time we're done with these books, like some of these are like 10 books in a pack. So by the time I finished reading book number 10, I forgot what was in book number five. And the most important thing also about these books is that these books, if you look at who's making the books, who is actually writing the books, these are the same companies that teach GMAT courses. So the idea of these books is that you get this book as a part of a course. And also when you come to our course, we also give you our book and we also give you the official GMAT guide. So you get these books as a part of a course and then you're gonna have some assignments. So the instructor is gonna say, read this, do these exercises, come to a class. I'm actually gonna teach you what really works. And then you go home and do some assignments from the book. So the book is the supplement to the training program. It was actually never designed to be a standalone study program by itself, just kind of for full disclosure. I know it might be surprising for some people, but that's what the books were designed. That's why there are different self-study programs and different life programs, but uh, the books by themselves are usually not enough. 
right? Especially because they don't really give us feedback and they don't help us sp stay focused on exactly what we need. So uh, that's why when a lot of people approach the GMAT this way, and uh, you know, Darwini approached it this way as well for the first four years, we call this a trial and error approach. The trial and error works really well if we're trying to do something that has never been done before. But the GMAT is something that has been done many, many times before. It's a test of patterns. It's a standardized test. That's why all we need to do is learn what works and what doesn't work. That's it. If Thomas Edison knew exactly what works and what didn't work, then he would, of course, be inventing the lamp in a day, not in many years. But we are creatures of habit. We've been trained to study a certain way. And that's why I wanted to show you really kind of interesting, but also a little bit of a shocking graph. And this is a graph that was shared with us by the GMAX, the same people who make the test. We belong to a very small uh, group of test prep organizations that get invited to the GMAC headquarters in Western Virginia every year. And now it's virtual, but we used to go there in person. It's a very small group, usually about 10, 15 people from different test prep organizations who the GMAC um, knows that they've been doing this for a long time. They do a good job. So uh, they want to keep good relationship with us and share a lot of things with us and kind of hear what we also see, what some of our students are struggling with. So here's what they shared with us. They said, well, here's some interesting statistics. Every year, 7 million people go to the websites that belong to MBA.com. So the MBA.com, GMAT.com, GMAC.com, 7 million unique visitors explore the GMAT. They read some information, they read a couple articles. And then of these people, 2 million people actually go ahead and either download the GMAT prep software or buy some sort of a GMAT book. and then supposedly begin studying for the test because they've downloaded the software. So guess how many people out of 2 million people a year who are getting a little more serious about preparing for the GMAT will actually do the real test? So these are numbers from the GMAT, 200,000 people. So only 10% of people who study for the GMAT will show up for the real test. 90% of people either say, this is not for me, this is too hard, this is too much work. I'm not really very serious about this. I'm not seeing progress. I'm getting overwhelmed. I'm getting too much anxiety. Not for me. And that means that they might be giving up their dreams of getting into a business school or maybe becoming future leaders and so on. And then of the 200,000 people, only 24,000, so about 12%, will actually get scores of 700 or more. So that's one in 300 people out of everybody who thought, oh, okay, I got to do the GMAT. Let me read some articles. Let me find out what this is. Only one in 300 people actually get a score of 700 or more. So to me, that's not very good odds. One in 300, right? You better play lottery. Some lotteries have a better chance. So how can we maximize our success? Well, one of the things we can do is very simple. We can just simply get a map. Imagine walking in the corn maze and you know need to get out before darkness, you can just say, well, what if I had a map? What if I knew exactly where to turn? And I know sometimes I take a detour and sometimes I'll get stuck a little, but I'll figure it out because at least I have a plan. And that's what a lot of self-study programs that are really designed to be start to finish self-study programs. And there are a few of them and we have that program as well. It's very affordable that you can go through step-by-step and we'll, we'll give you access to all of our strategies and we'll give you the exact plan. So you're gonna say, okay, on this week, here's what I'm doing. I can learn these strategies. Here's what I need to learn first. After that, here's what I need to learn next. Here's what I need to learn following that. And here's how I build up my confidence, my skills and my strategies. This is very, very important. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are studying for the GMAT and you don't have a plan of what are you gonna do first, second and third, how long it's gonna take, how are you gonna keep track of your progress, you might be just spinning your wheels a little. So I really wanna encourage you to get that plan. And if you need help putting together that plan, it comes with all of our programs, but if you need to help together, uh, putting together the plan, if you already have access to a lot of resources, some really good resources, come and get in touch with us and we'll help you put together that plan. So having a plan, having a map is really helpful, but what's an even better way? Well, that is just get into the maze with someone somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody who's been there many times. And it could be, maybe it could be a friend, 
if your friend knows how to teach, you know, I can honestly say I've been teaching the GMAT for 12 years, I'm still learning. So it's not that easy. Doing the GMAT is not the same as teaching the GMAT because we all have different backgrounds. It works for some people, might not necessarily work for others. So somebody has to be a really good teacher to be able to teach, not just a really good GMAT test taker. So if you are the kind of person who is saying, look, I value my time and I know what I need from life and I know I need to get into a top MBA program. I need a high GMAT score and I know I need all the help I can get because the investment in my GMAT prep is going to something that's going to pay me back. Then come and join us. Our GMAT mastery program. Now there are different options. I'll go through them really quickly because I want to get to doing another question as well. I wanted to show you a really cool question before we welcome JD. So this program is six or 12 weeks and you can take it in six weeks in an intensive format, which means it's about 20 hours a week in total with including homework and it's two four hour classes per week. That's a six week program. You can also take it in an extended 12 week program. That means one class per week. Uh, so you're taking quant and verbal for six weeks. Uh, one four-hour class per week. Now, all of our programs, all of our life programs come with a ton of support. We are a medium-sized company. So we're not a huge company. That means for us, the reputation is really important. We get invited to do a lot of seminars. I was doing a seminar with another school uh, today at noon, and tomorrow we get invited to another school in Spain to do a seminar for their candidates. So we get invited a lot because we know, or the schools know that a lot of our candidates get amazing results. And that's why for us, the reputation is really important. That's why we are going to invest a lot of time into coaching you and working with you because your success is really important. It's really, really important for us. Right? If you look through the GMAT, or through the uh, Google comments, then you actually see what I'm talking about. So if you, if you decide to join our live program, we're gonna work together really closely and we'll work together for up to a year. So you can come back and retake all of our classes for a year. We'll give you all the study materials, all the books, everything that you need. And our program is about 14 to 16.99 Canadian, a little bit less than US dollars. And um, you can save some money with an early bird discount. So if you go on adminmaster.com slash offer, you can actually see what's available. Our next course starts exactly one week from now. That means that the early bird discounts are going to expire very soon. So we're gonna give you another 48 hours if you decide to book your seat in a course. And after that, the price goes up to 16.99 uh, Canadian. So that's how our program works. It's the most popular. It's the program that uh, about 90% of our clients will take. And really with this program, if you were to do some research and maybe compare this program with others, uh, you're getting about 60 classroom hours. And if you look at the normal cost per teaching hour, it's about $50. Uh, you're getting an adaptive online platform that's going to be very in-depth, that's going to give you access to thousands of practice questions and nine practice tests. As part of the course, you're getting access to weekly office hours, but also three hours of private tutoring. And at most other companies, private tutoring is about $250 an hour. So we give this to you for free. Uh, you're getting all the GMAT books and we even help you with your MBA resume. So all of that put together is almost $5,000, but the regular fee for our course is $16.99. And if you do sign up for our next course in January, that's going to be only $14.99. And the course in November that starts in a week, that's just $15.99 Canadian. Now we do keep track of the success of our students. We keep in touch with all of our students because just it's a very high, high touch program. And the average entrance scholarship of our students is about $15,000. Now this is just one of the programs. Now this is a program that counts as full guarantee. That means we're gonna work together until you get your results. Uh, we do have other programs as well. Uh, there is a program that's uh, self-paced, completely self-paced. It's very affordable. Uh, and it uh, starts from less than $50 Canadian a month. Uh, you can find a special discount code and admitmaster.com slash offer. And you can also see a comparison. You can see kind of what's involved. And really the three options are live course that gets, gets you all of the support, all the help, all the live classes, access to the online class as well. Uh, the self prep program, the GMAT Express, it gets you access to all of the modules. But there are no books, no instructor support. That's why it's a lot more affordable. But you're learning the same things. And the GMAT Mastery On Demand, that's an option in the middle. This is where you're learning primarily by yourself. You're not coming to a live class. You're watching recorded classes. So you can work on your own pace. You can work faster or slower. And you're still going to be working with the instructor. So that's, uh, these are the three options. And if you need help figuring out what works better for you, then we can help you figure that out. 
The one thing I wanted to uh, mention really quickly is that they may not necessarily choose the program based on how much time you have. So if you have lots of time, then you know maybe self-study program might work better because you know time is money and we value that a lot. And that's why you came here. I wanted to give you as much as possible. And I know JD is here. So in just a few minutes, we'll talk about the MBA application tips as well. Uh, because I know your time is really valuable. And any time that you're not studying for the GMAT, you can be working in your business, you can be spending time with your family, spending time with your loved ones. So this time is really valuable. And if, if, we can, if you can learn something a lot faster, a lot more efficient, and get these results a lot more efficient, that's where the real value comes from. So somebody is asking, are these courses designed to come from the beginner to ready? And do I have to be at a certain state of readiness? This is an amazing question. Uh, now, the answer to this question is, when you sign up for our class, you don't have to know anything about the GMAT. You don't even have to remember what's an integer. But by the time you come to the first class, we will give you some preparation materials so that you can actually be ready. So that is why we really like to encourage you by offering these early bird discounts to sign up as far as possible in advance. Now, one week, is when the early bird discounts stop. Because at that point, we just say, look, you, it's probably just a little bit too soon. So if you haven't studied at all, maybe try to join our class in January. If you feel pretty comfortable with the basics, at least you know what's an integer, what's a fraction, what's a quadratic equation, you'd certainly welcome to start in the, on November 30th. But you don't need to know anything about the GMAT at all. Like You don't even have to know what the structure of the test. We're going to teach you all of that. But we do hope that you at least know the basics from school. And we are going to give you these refresher exercises. It's a part of a package. So you don't have to purchase anything else. You don't have to look for anything else. You just have to give yourself ideally anywhere from a week to four weeks to get ready for the classes using the resources we're going to provide. There'll be a couple of videos and there'll be some exercise we're going to ask you to uh, do before the first class. Hope this answers your questions. So let me show you one final question. And then I'll pass control to JD, who's going to share with you some really amazing things. OK, so here's the question. Now, OK, here's a quick question from Kasum. How a potential francophone candidate can manage to have a score of more or less 700? English is my third language for full disclosure. And I was able to get a score of 750. So the language that you speak doesn't really matter. We are going to give you some exercises to improve your reading abilities. However, it is really important that you score um, on a certain level on IELTS, so TOEFL. That's why when JD is going to talk about this, he's going to tell you that you do need a certain level of English. And we generally recommend that if you're working on your GMAT, work on your IELTS first. Get your IELTS done. Once you get that seven and a half or eight, uh, you're going to do really well on the GMAT because it's primarily coming down to your ability to read and pay attention to detail. And we'll teach you what detail to pay attention to. So if uh, French is first and English is second. That's, that doesn't really matter. We have a lot of clients from Montreal, by the way. Our biggest group of people are uh, Toronto and Montreal. These are our biggest, um, the way most of our clients come from. But now we also have a lot of people from different uh, countries in, in the world. Uh, now a lot of people from Africa, from India, from Asia, New Zealand even. Uh, so it doesn't really matter as long as you can comprehend English well and you can read well. You don't even have to speak English, but as long as you can read well, you can do well. Let me show you one final question, and then I'll leave you in good hands of JD. So here is, uh, but please get in touch with me, and we can chat a little bit more, and I can maybe give you a little bit of an assessment of, um, of what you might need to do and what would be a really good way for you to start your preparation. So here's the, uh, the question. Aaron will jog from home at X miles an hour and then walk back home by the same route at Y miles an hour. How many miles from home can Aaron jog? So he spends a total of two hours jogging and walking. Ooh, oh my God, what just happened? I don't know about you, but it looks a little overwhelming. So let me look at the answer choices. Maybe the answer choices are going to help. Oh, geez. I was really hoping for some numbers here, but these formulas, these variables, what's going on here? And when most people approach this, they say, OK, so what did we learn in school? The question is asking how many miles. So I know miles is distance. So distance is equal to rate times time. And I was given two rates, right? The person is jogging from home and then walking back home at two different rates. So maybe I can say that the distance from home was the speed x times the first time 
time from home and then there was time back home. I don't really know what these times are, but then I know the speeds. Uh, but I know the times together were T. So that's what I was told. He was away for a total of T hours. The distances are the same because he is walking back on the same route. Uh, and um, it looks like I have a few, uh, a few different variables here. I have T1 and T2, and maybe I can isolate a few things. And I don't know about you, but when I give this question to my students in a live class, after about five minutes, half of them don't even get closer to having the right answer because it looks complicated. And if you look at the back of the book, that's exactly what the book's gonna say. Okay, so just isolate a few things, kind of work a few formulas and you'll be good. Well, I think you know by now that there is a better way of doing this question. So with this specific question, we can do what's called the dimensional analysis. This is one of the strategies we teach in the class. By the way, you don't need to know, remember the term, but this is how the strategy works. The strategy is that if distance equal to rate times time, in order to get the distance, we need to multiply speed by time. We don't add speed to time, right? We multiply. So if I'm driving from Toronto to, let's say, London, Ontario, and I know I'm driving at 100 kilometers an hour, it takes me two hours, that the whole distance is 200. It's not 102 because I'm adding 100 kilometers an hour to two hours, it's 200. So that is why, I'm not really gonna add speed to time, but if I look through the answer choices, in answer choice B, I see X plus T. Well, X was the speed and T was the time. I know that can never happen. So B is not correct. Are there any other answer choices where I'm trying to add speed and time? Well, D and E all try to do the same thing. So now I'm down to two answer choices. That's again, two answer choices. One of them is correct. I wanna look at the one that's easier. So let me look at A. A says X divided by Y, so that miles an hour divided by miles an hour times T. That gives me an answer in hours, but I need miles. It gives me a ratio of two speeds times T, which is hours. So A cannot be the right answer. The only answer that's left is C. And if you're in an engineer, you probably remember the term dimensional analysis. If you're not, then all you can do is just figure out that, wow, that, that's what I do. I just multiply speed and time. So what answer choices multiply speed and time? That's all I need. And that's how you get to the right answer. By the way, this is not an easy question. You also showed up in the official guide. Now it's not there anymore. So that's why if you want to get a high score, see most people who make it to the test, remember only 10% of people do, they learn the theory, they learn the books, they take lots and lots of notes and they get an average score of 560. And some people get more, some people get less. But if you take the time to really learn these strategies, if you learn these skills, if you learn how to think differently, pay the right attention to detail, identify the right strategy, and really very confidently move forward, have the right plan, you can get a much higher score. The average score of our students is 670, and over a third of our students will get scores above 700. And almost everybody who takes our course will actually do the test. Now, of course, not everybody is gonna get a score of 670, that's an average half the people get above that. So you might be asking a question is, what score will I really get? Well, my answer is it depends. Whatever score you need, that's the score you can, you can get. We might require a lot of work. So for example, Brian came to us and said, look, I got two months, I need 760. Tell me what I need to do. I said, okay, here's what you gotta do. And he was able to study full time, thankfully to him. And in literally in six weeks, he was able to get a score of 760. He was starting a new job at Google in California. He said, I don't have any more time. If I'm not doing this now, that's it. So in two months, he was able, or less than two months, he was able to achieve that score. Here's another example. Fionn also came to us and said, I need a high score, but I have like so little time. She is a nurse in the emergency room. She had to arrange her shifts to come to our class. But outside of that uh, schedule of the class, he just said, I'm just going to continue practicing until I get that score. And we, have, we provide all the support, all the resources for you. So for her, it took like seven or eight months, but she was able to get that score of 760 because she really wanted it. So if you have the time and you're willing to dedicate the time, and if you need a certain score, you will definitely get it. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are the kind of person, that's the final thing I'm gonna say. If you are the person who 
really knows what you want from life, who really knows where you want to take your career, and you're committed to getting to the best possible school for you and really getting these results because you believe that you can make the world a better place or maybe, maybe just make a lot of money by doing an MBA and hopefully make the world a better place. And if the GMAT is what stands between you and the test, then we are here to help you. Now, we do admissions counseling as well, so we can help you on that front too. But come and join us in our virtual class. Our next virtual class starts next week on Tuesday, November 30th. And then we're going to have the next weekend class that's Saturday and Sunday morning. So depending on your time zone, one or the other might work. The evenings is 6 to 10 Eastern time. The weekends is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday and Sunday. If you're not ready to start yet and you just want to come and check out our verbal refresher class, I notice many of you haven't really been at that class yet. And that class is on December 14th. You can register on our website. We'll send you a link as well. Uh, if you've never taken a practice test, that's usually a really good first step. You can come here to ivy.trygmod.com. You can fill out the form, uh, get a link to this practice test, and you can actually try it out, see what it's like. And you can find the links to all of these at admitmaster.com. I will be following up with you tomorrow by email. I'll send you a bunch of things, but I'd love to know if you would like for us to chat. If you are the kind of person who is in work, I really need to make some good decisions for me. So please help me figure out. And it will be just my, my pleasure to help you. I do a lot of consultation, like I mentioned, every day. So tomorrow I'm going to set up, set some time aside, and I'll get in touch with you. All right, there's somebody saying that you just lost my sound. Sorry about that. I was just going to say that it was a huge pleasure that I want to invite J.D. Clark, Executive Director of the, from the Ivy Business School, who's going to share with you some amazing strategies that are going to help you get into business school. Because guess what? When you're applying to a business school, you would really need to prepare an application that is going to catch attention of the business school. And this is a competitive process. So knowing what the business school admissions office is looking for is just something that I wish I knew when I was applying to business schools. And that's exactly what JD is going to share with you right now. So please help me welcome JD. JD, if you can unmute yourself and um, you can take yourself off video mute as well. And I'm actually going to stop the share. Yeah. Hi, Sergey. Pleasure to be joining you today. So, and thank you everyone uh, for being here. What I'm going to do for the next, uh, I'm just going to share my screen quickly here. So, what I'm going to do for the next uh, 20 minutes is walk you through a presentation. And really, what this presentation is going to cover is some admissions tips and tricks. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to approach the decision to do an MBA, but also, you know, how do you put together a very strong application, put your best foot forward. I'll use Ivy as sort of a case study as we go through it, but a lot of the tips and tricks that I'll share with you is, is good for any MBA program uh, that you apply for. So it's my pleasure to be with you today. And I, I always love uh, being here with Sergey and uh, sharing some of these uh, tips uh, with you. So uh, what I'll do is just share with you my LinkedIn profile. I'll also share it at the end of the presentation as well. It's a great way for us to connect. And I also share several articles about Ivy um, and also about business education in general. So it's, it would be great to uh, connect with you on LinkedIn. It's a great way to stay in touch. And again, anything that I can do to help you with this decision to do an MBA, help you put together an application. I've got lots of experience in working with various MBA programs 
across the globe. So always happy to help out in any way that I can. Um, I want to talk about the decision to do an MBA because it is a big decision uh, to do an MBA program. And frankly, a decision you'll only do once. Uh, and that's what makes it big. You know, if you think about, you know, maybe making another big decision like taking a new job, if the job doesn't work out, you find another one, right? But the MBA is a lifelong decision. And so really important that you put a lot of thought into the decision. I came across this TED talk about two or three years ago, and I always use it as I talk to candidates about doing an MBA program, because I think it's a really great TED talk on how you should approach uh, a difficult decision. Uh, the TED talk is done by somebody called Ruth Chang, and Ruth has an interesting background. She did a PhD, uh, she did a PhD in philosophy, but before that, she did her undergraduate degree in philosophy, and then you know, thought, what am I gonna do with a philosophy degree and undergrad degree? and did a law degree at Harvard and never liked it. And then went back and did her PhD in philosophy. And her area of research is around this thing of making difficult decisions. Ruth talks about three things in this video that I wanna to highlight to you. The first thing that she talks about is what makes a difficult decision. And it's really covered in this quote. And you'll find this with an MBA program. It, it's really around anytime you're doing a pros and cons list, that's a difficult decision. The second thing that she talks about is when we are faced with a difficult decision, human nature sometimes makes us default to the easiest choice, not necessarily the best choice. We get overwhelmed. And I think if we all look back at you know, decisions that we've made, sometimes when you get overwhelmed with a decision, you kind of default to the easiest choice, not necessarily the best decision for you. And quite frankly, the easiest choice in all of this is not to do an MBA. And, and I know, Sergey, you always share those stats of those that sign up on the GMAC website and those that actually go forward and writing a GMAT. It's a very small percentage. So I'd really encourage you as you go through this process is always do that check with yourself. Am I making the right decision or am I making the easiest decision? The last thing that she talks about is gives you some advice on, and a framework on how you should approach a difficult decision. And it starts with this question on what matters most to you. And I'd really encourage you as you think about this process, think about what matters most to you. Think about it from what curriculum you're looking for, what career you might want, but also think about the culture of the school. You know, is this a place, what's really important to me as I think about this experience? And as you kind of formulate what matters most to you, then it becomes easier to evaluate the different alternatives that are there. We often get questions about rankings. You know, how do I look at rankings? How do I do it? We are very proud of our overall rankings. We've ranked uh, number one in Canada by Business Week several years. We've also been ranked uh, number one in Canada by Financial Times. But I'd, I'd encourage you to look outside of the overall rankings because these publications and these magazines, what they do is they actually take survey data from people that have done the program, they collect data from the schools and they compile all of these variables into an overall score of the rankings. And where you can use the rankings is really looking at the criteria of those rankings or those components of the rankings. And again, connecting it to what matters most to you. So I'm gonna give you a little demonstration or some data that shows you just a little bit about why you should look at the rankings by the components and less by the overall score. And I use Financial Times. So one of the things Financial Times does is they actually go out and they survey alumni and they ask, were you employed three months after graduation when you did your MBA program? They also ask the school for some data. They ask us about, you know, is your corporate social responsibility core courses and how many hours is it? What we've done in our program is we have integrated corporate social responsibility across our core courses. So we don't have a corporate social responsibility core course, but it's, it's modules within the different uh, courses that you take in core. They also ask for data around the faculty that are published in academic journals, specific ac academic journals from Financial Times, but they have ranked the top 50 journals. They also give points to schools that have a second language requirement. One of the things you'll find is very, I worked in a European school, very common in European schools to have a second language requirement but very, very uncommon for North American schools, Canada and US to have a second language requirement. So we don't get any points in the rankings because we don't have a second language requirement. They also give 
uh, points to the school if you have 100% of an advisory board outside your home country. So our advisory board, which is made up of about 60 alumni, are international, but also individuals within uh, Canada as well. And then they also give points if your percentage of female faculty members is 50%. So if you look at this, the most important criteria is that first one, employment rate after graduation. That's worth 2% of the rankings. These bottom criteria is worth 20%. So what this is, is that you're really important to look at what matters most to you in the rankings. So I'm gonna talk about us, what matters most to us here at Ivy as we look at the experience we deliver but also how we do in the rankings. And, and really it comes down to three things, very, very simple. The first is the quality of the education you, you receive and that impact on the education on your career. So what was the quality of the education? What was the impact? And really meeting your career objectives. And the third thing is, you know, what is the networking opportunities and what do recruiters think about, you know, uh, the talent that's coming out of our program? So I'm gonna share with you three rankings that, uh, that we have in, in that space of what matters most to us. Economist goes out and they do uh, a ranking each year. They go out and they actually survey 100, uh, you know, do ranking of the top 100 uh, business schools across the globe. And they ask a lot of questions to recent uh, graduates about their experience. And so for four years in a row, out of 100 of those schools, we have always ranked in the top 10 for four years in a row out of 100 on what our alumni thought of the education experience that was delivered. They also asked them a question about, you know, what was the career services like? And not only for that first job, but, you know, prepping you for managing your career moving forward. And for five years in a row, we've been ranked in the top 20. The lowest that we've ranked is uh, 16th. Uh, this past year, we were number 11. And again, this is survey data uh, from alumni. And the last is this idea of networking. So Business Week does a ranking each year. They actually do a international ranking and a US ranking. International ranking is all schools of the US. So if you combine those two together, you're looking at about 131 schools that they rank across those two rankings. And they give a score of networking. What they do with that score is they actually ask alumni, they ask current students about the networking opportunities uh, that the program has given them, both in the program and also alumni. They actually go out and ask recruiters too. And they ask questions on the corporate partners on, you know, what was the talent like coming out of the program? So out of 131 schools ranked, our score for networking is uh, number 15th uh, globally. So those are some rankings again, that really, really matter to us because what's important to us is the quality of the education we deliver, the what it does to your career and how we support you in that and also the networking opportunities that the program provides. So what I'm gonna share with you is just a little bit of a profile on uh, our program, but I wanna start with this strong piece of advice. When you are applying to a program, doesn't matter whether it's Ivy or any MBA program there, Never, ever, ever self-select yourself out. Never sit there and say, well, I'm not a typical MBA candidate. I'm not a, you know, maybe a candidate for this school. Don't ever self-select yourself out. Diversity matters in the classroom. This is really passionate to me personally because I did my MBA. I did it at Ivy and, uh, you know, I did it on the older end of the spectrum. And the reason that I did it in the older end of the spectrum is I never thought that I was a typical MBA candidate didn't come from a traditional business background. I worked in you know, universities and post-secondary education. And I also had a history degree. I did no math past grade 10. Uh, you know, I had an arts degree and never thought that I was like MBA material. I couldn't have been any more wrong. And my only regret of doing uh, you know, my MBA is I wish I would did it earlier. So really passionate to never ever self-select yourself out. So sometimes what happens is when you look at class profiles, you go, well, there's not really people like me. Don't worry about that. We've had individuals in our program that are professional athletes. We've had musicians, people with arts degrees, artists, people that have served in the military and that diversity is really, really important. To give you a sense of our program, we have about 150 students. Uh, average age is 28, just over 28. Age range is 23 to 34. Work experience is uh, five and a half years on average. A minimum work experience is two years, which I'll talk about when we go the application, two to 10 years, 38% female, very diverse internationally. So 25 different passports represented, 24 different birth countries in a program of 150 people. 
We have about 30% of our students that are international. So they immigrate to Canada specifically for this program, but the nature of Canada itself is it's very international, that about 50% of our students are born outside of Canada. And then I think the big thing is we have 42 different industries represented. So a very diverse classroom. But again, the key point here is never ever self-select yourself out. So what I'm gonna do is I've structured this presentation to actually go through different elements of our application and give you some tips and tricks. You will find this is very common across MBA programs. Doesn't matter, they might be different labels on it, but basically we look at five things. We're gonna start talking about what leadership and experience, uh, experience and potential look like. It is very common in an MBA program that you do not come in. So again, that a lot of people don't have formal leadership experience, but leadership experience doesn't necessarily mean that you have people reporting to you. So I'm gonna talk about the work experiences and how to highlight that. I'm gonna talk about your references and how, you know, who should you think about using for references? Give you some tips around that. I'm gonna talk about previous academic experience and what programs look for and what we look for. And, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time at looking, you know, talking about the GMAT or GRE because Sergey has done that, but I'll talk about how we kind of view the GMAT in combination with your previous academic experience. And then I'm gonna end talking about the admissions interview. I will also touch on giving you some tips about the video essays and written essays. You'll find a lot of schools use video essays now. So let's talk about the work experience. Um, we look for, and you'll find this is the case with many top MBA programs. We look for two years full-time uh, quality work experience. And that's really important because it adds value to the classroom and to the team learning. There are going to be two areas in our program, but you're going to find this pretty much in every program. They're going to ask you to fill out an online application. For many schools, this is what you talk about what you do. So you won't be given a lot of space, but this is where you would talk about your job description. You know, here's what I'm responsible for. So it's very much like, you know, here's what you do. And then you're going to be asked to provide a resume. Sometimes the schools will ask for a letter of introduction that really brings a lot more to your experience on the how about your job. And this is where you're going to talk about your accomplishments and your impact. For us, we ask you to do that in a resume. And uh, we don't provide you a template. We don't want to keep you to a certain sort of you know, page limit. So you're not applying for a job here. You're applying to an MBA program for us. If you need more than one page, need more than two pages to kind of highlight those accomplishments, feel free to use so. But the key thing is when you're looking at applying to an MBA program, you kind of want to look at from this point of view of saying, you know, shift your thinking from here's what I do on a daily basis and talk about what are those impact and accomplishments that you're most proud of in your career. And sometimes that takes some reflection of us to think about. I remember attending a job interview probably about five or six years ago, and I remember it was a panel interview and the chair of the panel, so who, who this job would have reported to, asked a great question, said, you know, I've got one more question for you. If you think about that pinnacle of your career, like the highest, highest point you were, where you really, really felt the proudest of the work and your accomplishments, what would that be? And so think about that question as you're kind of thinking about applying to an MBA program, those impact and accomplishments. So when we think about impact and accomplishments, I want to give you some examples of some of those things you might want to highlight and think about. Again, we're not looking at you fill out all of these. These are just giving you some samples of what you might include. Think about when you've shown initiative to get something done, your ability to get things done. So think about those projects where when they finished, you were so proud of it. We had to self-manage, we had to figure things out. Um, I remember uh, sitting in an interview probably four or five years ago, and somebody talked about giving an example where they were volunteering uh, for, uh, it, it was uh, Right to Play, which goes to developing nations, play sports for kids. And the kids that they were working with did not speak English. So it's, how, how do you get their attention? She actually learned and taught herself how to juggle. And when she would juggle, the kids would all surround herself. And it was a great example when you think about, you know, how you kind of figure things out yourself. Big picture thinking. Uh, we had to kind of think on sort of more of a big picture level versus like day-to-day -day tasks. We had to work in teams and, and that could take, you know, where you may have struggled with teams and had to work it, where you might've been supportive to a team member, where you had to persuade and communicate. A lot of times people talk about selling an idea uh, internally within their organizations. 
making and assisting decisions. And, and I put assisting in there because a lot of times people will say, well, I'm not really the final decision maker, but do you make suggestions? Yeah, I do that all the time. And do they act on your suggestions? Yeah, most of the time, then you're making a decision. So think about those times where you've shaped decisions. And then the last one's pretty self-evident, solving problems. So again, this is just to give you some examples of some things that you might want to uh, highlight in an application. Talk about references. Uh, schools are different. Some schools ask for letters of reference. Some schools are very specific on the references that they would like to have. What we do here at Ivy is it's actually a form the references fill out. You'll see that form. It's part of our online application. What you do is fill out your references information. You execute sending them the online form. They fill it out. They're asked to rank you from character and abilities and some open-ended questions. So not a letter that they have to do. But how, which references should you select? So for us, we want at least one of those references to be professional in nature. We ask for two, you can include more if you want to. But the best suggestion I have about the references is you think about those impact and accomplishments you wanna highlight, align that to your references. So make sure what you're talking about in your application is you align them in the references. The biggest mistake I see people do in references is they take somebody with an impressive title. And they say, wow, this would really help me but maybe that person hasn't really worked with you and they can't provide the depth of what we're looking for in the commentary of your sort of the ratings or the open-ended questions. So when you read it, make sure that you know you're picking people that can provide that depth. And I will tell you that sometimes when people choose maybe a reference that is title oriented and then it comes back like, well, I haven't really observed this person, it sometimes can demonstrate a lack of judgment. So make sure that you're choosing people that have really observed your character and abilities. Meet with your references early. You know, talk to them about why you wanna do an MBA program, provide them with a deadline. For us here at Ivy, you don't need your references when you apply, you need them by the time that your file is reviewed by the admissions committee after the interview, but they can arrive uh, afterwards as well. So that's just some tips as you think about the uh, references. Previous academic experience, we get a lot of questions around this. You know, what is the minimum grade point average? What are the grades that you look for? And I'll be quite honest is it is very rare that an MBA program will have a minimum GPA. I'm gonna describe that a little bit is, it is very common that if you're applying to a law school or medical school right after university or other graduate studies right after university, they look at the GPA because that's all they have to go off of. But in an MBA program, there are two things that kind of compensate for academic performance or we look at in addition. One is your professional experience. The second is the GMAT. And I will share with you that we do look at only the grades from your last two years or your most recent degree. But again, there's no minimum GPA. What we do is if you have low grades, we will put more emphasis on the GMAT. The GMAT provides a strong measure or the GRE provides a strong measure of your academic capability. And so I'm gonna share with you, I had horrible grades in my undergrad. I think it was partly a program that I, you know, I was, I had other interests outside of, uh, you know, my studies at the time, uh, but I was, and I was immature. I also didn't like the program of study. You know, it's one of those things I really liked history in high school, did not like it in university. And so I did not do well in university. Again, another reason why I delayed thinking about going to graduate school. And then when I applied for my MBA, I just really, really focused on writing a GMAT. I got a GMAT of 680. So if you write a strong GMAT, then your previous undergraduate grades aren't gonna matter. So we look at both of them together. We also consider the program of study. So if you graduated from an engineering program, we may look less at the quants and maybe more on the verbal side. If English is a second language, we're gonna look more at the verbal score. For me, for instance, I did a history degree. I didn't do uh, any stats courses when I was in university. So for sure they looked at my quantitative score. So the key thing here is we look at the GMAT or GRE in combination with your GPA as well. So video, I'm gonna talk about the essays and there are two essays uh, that you'll find that schools do. A lot of schools use video essays now. And that's an opportunity for you to bring some personality into your application. These are not technical questions. They are not questions that you have time to prepare for in you know, ahead of time. It is like doing an interview. You get a question, what happens is we get two questions. We have a bank of about 50. 
you're randomized, you get two, uh, two questions, you have 30 seconds to prepare and then about a minute to give your answer. You have the opportunity, we do some test questions ahead of time to test the technology ahead of time. I always say to people, give yourself 30 minutes to complete the process. You want to kind of want to get settled into your seat and kind of give your, probably takes 15 minutes from beginning to end, but give yourself sort of 30 minutes and find a quiet space to do it. These are not technical questions. These are more getting acquainted questions. So to give you an example, one is you're all of a sudden given a day off, you know, last minute, what, what would you do with your time? So they're very much just to get to know you as an individual. Dress professionally, treat this like an interview. Being nervous is normal. We're asking you to think on your feet. So being nervous is normal. And there's no right answer that we're looking for. Again, it's just to get to know you more than what's written in your essays and get to know you uh, more on, you know, you as an individual and you as a person. Written essays. You'll find that most schools will have a minimum of about two essay questions and give you a tips uh, around it. You'll find the most common essay question as you're filling out an MBA program is why the certain school, why doing an MBA. One of the things you want to do is make sure to answer the question. And my advice on that is when you give it to somebody to proofread, don't give them your answer. Don't give them the question. And as they proofread your answer, tell them, what do you think the question is? That's a great way to think that you've answered the question. This is another important point. You know, when people say essays, and there is a word limit in the essays, and we'll talk about it as, you don't have time to think about this like an academic essay. You know, the hamburger approach, you have the intro, then you have the body, then you have the clothes. You just don't have enough of a word count to do that. Keep these very informal and keep them conversational. And so write it for an audience of one. Sergey and I always do these sessions on a Tuesday, uh, mostly on a Tuesday night. And on Wednesdays, we have our admissions committee meetings. And so I always prep on Tuesday afternoons and into the evening for admissions committee. And so do the other uh, members of our admissions committee. And what we do is we read the essays individually. So write the essays like you're talking to somebody in a, in a room, right? And it just allows you to kind of personalize it, but also uh, to make sure that, you know, it really resonates to people and how they read it. The biggest mistake here's what I see is people try to fit everything into a limited time or word limit. So you'll find the essays all have word limits. This is a snapshot. So I'm going to give you an analogy. I love analogies. So I'll give you one here. Think about the trailer to a movie. You know, if you're flicking around Netflix, you flick on the trailer, maybe the movie's two hours, but the trailer's probably two minutes, 30 seconds, two and a half minutes. It's meant to give you the headlines. So treat the essays like the trailer. The movie is your interview. You're gonna have an opportunity to explain more and to talk more about your experience in an interview. Here's the biggest advice as you think about writing the essays. Be clear, be concise, be creative, but most importantly, be yourself. This is really important. Don't write the essays for what you think the school wants to hear. The problem with that is when you get into the interview and the interviewer is gonna talk about stuff that's in your essays. And if anybody's ever been for job interviews, you tend to get pro, right? It's not just one question. It's, well, tell me more about that. Well, what did you do about that? If this is not an authentic story to you or not something meaningful to you, your story's going to collapse when you get into the interview. So again, be clear, be concise, be creative, and most importantly, be yourself. Let me talk about the interview. It's really important to kind of talk to the schools about who will be doing your interview. Uh, how we do our interviews here at Ivy is they're members of our career management team. They're actually the career coaches that will work for you in the program. And the reason they do that is we want to get to know your experience, want to get to know more about your what your career goals to make sure the program's a good fit for you. You know, does your experience, what you're bringing to the table really fit with the recruiter expectations uh, that they will be looking for? And that's really important to us. Um, the thing about interviewing is it's really about storytelling. It doesn't matter whether you're interviewing for an MBA program for a job. It's about telling stories about your experience. You want to be prepared. You want to be prepared to talk about those meaningful experiences to you, but not to be scripted. What that means is you want to have some of the stuff written down, but you don't want to be obviously reading from a script. You want to be yourself. And again, going back to what I talked about the essays, it's really important that yourself. And the key thing here is Go into this knowing that you know your experience better than anybody else. That's the mindset you have to have. Do your research on the program, practice. 
get a family member or friend, practice your, your different storytelling. And at the end, always make sure that you have intelligent questions for your interviewer prepared. Some final thoughts. It's really important you connect with each school. We're here to help. And it's really important you connect with each school before you apply for the program. We're here to help you put your best foot forward. And also when you're in the admissions committee, it's good to have that relationship of working with you through the process. Really important to get to know the culture of each school. You know, what's beyond the brochures, what's beyond just the curriculum. You know, reach out to current students, talk to alumni, you know, through the application process. We have tons of events where you can, you know, engage with our students and really get to know what the culture is. Align your application submissions. So when you're applying to schools, make sure you apply around the same times because the big thing is you wanna make sure that you get all your options available to you before you have to make a decision. That's also making sure, don't be shy of saying to the school, look, I know I have a deadline of an offer at this date. Can you extend it? Because I'm waiting to hear from other schools or to say to schools, look, I've got answers from other schools. Is there any way that you can expedite uh, my application? The last, which goes back to what we talked about at the beginning, be thoughtful about this decision. It is lifelong. The last thought I'll stay with you is what I love about my job. And, and I truly, you know, I always say, I've had jobs in the past what I like, but when you love a job is when it doesn't feel like work. And what I love about my job is that, you know, I describe it as that I'm in the dream business. And I know that science counter science corny, but you know, what I love is seeing people that, you know, this transforms them, not only professionally, but personally. And I think this quote really covers it. You're always one decision away from a totally different life. And I can tell you as somebody that's worked for years in MBA programs and seen the impact this has on individuals, it has an incredible impact. That's not just about that job right after their MBA, it's about, you know, setting them up for a totally different uh, life. There's a couple of things if you're interested and I'll leave it on this next step slides and then take questions. But we, uh, you know, one of the things we do at Ivy, if you're interested in our program, send a resume or LinkedIn profile for preliminary assessment, allows us to get to know you, help you through the application process. We have lots of great podcasts, webinars. We have some experience events uh, that, uh, you know, you can uh, join a mock class. Uh, you can participate in panel discussions, learn more about the program and then also the application process. So with that, Sergey, I'll open it up to any questions that anybody uh, may have. So uh, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to join you. Thank you so much, JD. And as always, I really love- put my LinkedIn there, so. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, as always, I really love your tips. And especially if you're joining us for the first time and you're hearing these tips for the first time, I, I think that they're super, super valuable. From my side, I just wanna echo what uh, JD was saying is please get in touch with the school. Uh, there's so many opportunities available. How can you, I mean, you wouldn't buy a house without first stepping into a house and looking at the kitchen. So why would you uh, apply to a school without first talking to a school and without first sitting in a class and really connecting with people? That's really a great way to not only for you to understand that this is the right fit, but then for you to then be able to communicate very clearly during your application process that is, this is the, really the decision that was very thoughtful. Uh, so thanks again for sharing all these strategies. Now, if you have any questions whatsoever to JD or to myself after the class, then uh, I've already shared in chat box JD's LinkedIn, um, a link to the LinkedIn profile, and then we'll send you um, also uh, JD's contact information, my contact information tomorrow by email. Um, or you could just uh, go on uh, the Ivy website and there is a button to get connected with the admissions office as well. If you have any final questions before we close, please put them in the chat box. We'll give you another 30 seconds or put them in the Q&A box. Otherwise, uh, we'll let you go. Thanks so much. Yes, uh, see a lot of uh, thank yous here in the chat box. So again, thanks so much for joining us and please do remember we are here for you. So if there's anything you need whatsoever, uh, then we're here to help you make the best decisions. Thanks again and good luck. Yeah, thank you, Sergey, And thank you, everyone. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to do these sessions. So thank you. Thank you so much, JD. Thanks so much okay. for joining us. Yeah, have Take a care. great night, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.